Grinder type stuff, where it's all the same stuff. Good evening, everybody. Let's uh, get started with the sixth leaf set meeting. It's a bit of a milestone for us. And as always, we want to thank everybody for coming. We obviously wouldn't exist without the community. This is made for the community. Um, you are all the, you know, the force behind Cleavesec. Use the Twitter to your advantage, the hashtag Cleavesec. Uh, the meetups, uh, of course, you know, we're all here today, so the SVPs are out there. The discussion forums in the meetup group is out there for everybody to post your ideas, uh, projects, discuss any, any sort of, uh, anything that you want, really, it's open. So thanks for coming and thanks for being a part of the community. We do have a few rules. First rule, don't be a dick. Nobody likes that guy. So, um, you know, be respectful of, of people's ideas. Be respectful that they're willing to come up here and present their ideas and speak to everybody. Sometimes it's quite a daunting task. But at the same time, don't take yourself too seriously. We're here to have fun, to share our experiences, to learn from each other. So, you know, we're not, uh, we don't want to be that guy, but we also don't want to be super uptight about everything. And third, it's our Fight Club rule. Tonight, if it's your first time at Cleave Sec, you will come up and give a brief introduction about yourself. So, you can find Cleave Sec at these places. Um, Twitter is our main hub. We tweet a bunch of stuff out from the account. Um, like I already said, you can use the hashtag for um, any sort of, sort of sorts of ideas or projects that you have in mind. If you um, are thinking about coming and, and speaking, you can um, you know, get ideas from the community. If you're working on a project at work and you want input from the community, use the, the hashtag for that, those sorts of things. We have the meetup site where you can find information about the upcoming meetups. We have the the speaker meetup is every second Tuesday of the month, and the community night is the last Tuesday of the month. We have a LinkedIn group, which is just kind of obligatory. We don't really do anything there, but um, you can join if you want to. And please like at gmail.com uh, for uh, any, any topics that you don't want to expose publicly through Twitter. If it's something that you want to reach us privately, you can send an email to please like at gmail.com if you want to uh, you know, submit for a, for a talk that, uh, but you're not quite sure exactly what to do and you want some input from us privately you can go ahead and email, email us there and finally youtube.com slash user slash cleavesec where we post the videos from these meetings the community night doesn't get recorded obviously um, but all of, the, all of our previous uh, presentation meetings, speaker meetings are all in there, and you can go ahead and catch up if you um, if you haven't participated in the past. The descriptions are all there, and uh, they, all, they all should have exact uh, timestamps for when the the speeches, the presentations start. And again, I will emphasize that this is a community effort. So, if you know um, anyone that's interested in inf information security especially for developers or students or you know, anyone who, who can potentially have a big impact in the InfoSec community. Go ahead and spread the word to them as well. So we, um, I guess one of our biggest challenges is reaching those outside of the, the already established InfoSec community that's around Twitter. So, uh, you know, talk to your devs, um, teachers, your past teachers, to have them come and, and bring their students and, and bring devs, um, even QA testers if you know them. So tonight's agenda, we've got Warren Kopp talking about virtualizing your home lab. He's got some excellent resources to help you get started in your um, extracurricular practice. And Lindsay Latessa talking about what recruiters want in today's tech market. And we, she has a, a huge list of questions that we've previously gathered in preparation for today, but uh, we're also encouraging discussion and extra questions from the audience. With that, it's time for the first timers to come up. So all you have to do is the following. 
My name is Mario Nepomuceno. I work at Highland Software and something interesting about me is I went to military school in Brazil and that really pushed me to not join the military. <laughs> <laughs> Who's next? First timers, come on, don't be shy, everyone's gonna do it. You can go there, you go. I'm Matt Neely, I actually work here at Secure State. I'm actually just gonna be here for a few minutes, so I wanna come up and say hi for, for coming out. Um, and uh, yeah, so interesting stuff about myself. Um, I can tie a bow tie. <laughs> Give me enough time. Director of IT at Segaris Marketplace, just had to split from them, so I'm now trying to figure out what all I want to be doing. And something about me, as a boy, I was a boy soprano in opera at the Cleveland Institute of Music and at Baldwin Wallace. I'm Ron Gallimore, I'm a network administrator down at Supply One just around the corner. This is a perfect spot for me. <laughs> and I am not interested, I'm sorry. I got nothing. <laughs> Hi, my name is Thomas. I also work here at Secure State. Uh, I just started here, I'm still within my days, but uh, something interesting is I was served in the Army for about four years. Hi, my name is Kenneth Atchison. I'm the, one of the professors at Baldwin Wallace University. I teach uh, computer science and network security, and I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. Hi, I'm Ben Morris. Uh, I work at, uh, at, at onshift.com. Uh, it's a Software is this. It's a scheduling software uh, company. We sell software to hospitals and stuff. Um, an interesting thing about me is uh, I, don't know, I, I like Linux, I guess, and I like uh, DevOps stuff. I don't know. Hi, I'm Mike Benich. I am a high school science teacher. I have a background in physics and CS, and I'm here to network with all of you about implementing that kind of stuff in the high school classroom at Brexville Broadview Heights High School, so just down the road. Insurance slash business analyst for Avantia Incorporated down in uh, Independence. And something interesting about me my son just celebrated his first birthday on Saturday, and that's just about it. I'm Carol Tabellion, and I work at Integrated Marketing Technologies. get set up for Warren Cup and uh, you can take the time to grab a drink or another sandwich. Pretended that 
a former employer's environment was a virtual lab for <laughs> certain things. Um, Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, so just to get this started, this talk was not my idea. I was asked to do a talk, and the first thing I could come up with was cloning somebody else. So this guy, Tom Moore, gave a wonderful talk at DerbyCon. I urge you to go and watch his talk as well on the same subject. He took a little bit of a different approach than I did, but he was super nice, sent me all his slides, gave me a lot of help putting this talk together um, just for asking. I said, hey, I enjoyed your talk. He said, wonderful. What can I do to help? Um, so that's almost 100% been my reaction and reflection and experience with the security industry, and I'm learning more and more that that's just the way it goes. That's what Cleavesec is trying to promote. That's what we're all trying to build here. So understand that security is a very big sharing culture, and it's getting more so every year. So the second attribution up there is blog posts. Every lab I've built, every vulnerable app I've played with, everything I've put together, downloaded or installed, I've found at least a half dozen blog posts that helped me through it one way. Some of them were right, some of them were wrong, some of them had stuff I could improve. But everyone's out there trying to share their experience, everybody's trying to help everyone else get a foot ahead. This is just another one of my contributions that I can do out there. And I found those blog posts by Googling for things like security lab, do-it-yourself penetration testing, learning environments, things like that. Oh, Alright. The other caveat is this is opinionated. I pick the stuff that I know, the stuff that I like, the stuff that I have had success with. There are other ways to do this. Like anything in technology, there's probably a few dozen ways to get to the end goal of having a virtual lab where you can learn how to do things. Um, I prefer Macs, Mac OS, VirtualBox, Windows, Dell, and VMware. In no order, in no real preference, it just depends on what I'm doing. Um, I've listed some alternatives to those things as we go along just to cover my bases. I don't have a lot of experience, and I'll say that again as I get to the specific ones. But I want you to understand that this is the way I did it. This doesn't have to be the way you do it, but these are some good ideas to get you along the way. Yeah. So, yeah, the big point there is find what works for you. Don't take this as the only way to do it or the best way to do it. This is just the way I do it. And keep trying. It's not easy. Ten years ago, I worked at CompUSA at the returns desk. Five years ago, I worked as a graphic designer making other people's artwork print on our printers. A few years after that, I was doing help desk and QA, and now I do AppSec. The only reason I got there is because I tried harder. I found a goal, I figured out the pieces that would help me get farther along that path, and I did them as I could, one at a time, two at a time. I came to things like this, I built things at home, I read blog posts, I followed on Twitter, I asked lots of questions, I asked lots of questions of strangers in very uncomfortable situations, but I learned. The other thing I learned is InfoSec is complicated. Um, somewhere on a podcast I heard that to get into InfoSec you probably need about 10 years as a sysadmin, 10 years as a developer, 10 years as a network admin, 5 or 10 years doing DBA stuff then maybe you'd be about entry level. That's the kind of stuff you can run into in InfoSec. Now, the reality is nowhere near that bad, right? I told you 10 years ago I worked at CompUSA and did nothing effectively, so. It's a good mindset to keep, though, that you want to be able to at least converse in a lot of different areas, even if you don't see it day to day. Like I said, I do AppSec, but I still play with infrastructure at home. I build networks, I build computers, and I make them talk to one another, and I test that, I troubleshoot. I try and learn what makes it work, what makes it doesn't, wakes it not, excuse me. So, that's a lot of things to learn. <laughs> um, it seems like it'd be really expensive to get hands-on with all those things. Free databases are free, but SQL Server's not, Oracle's not, networking equipment's not, building all that stuff, it's expensive. You can't get Cisco gear for free. But how can you learn all of it? Like I said before, everybody wants to share. I haven't met anybody who's like, well, I can't really tell you what that is. Person to person, anybody will tell you any of their techniques one way or another. 
especially if they, they're proud of it because they're proud of it. They want to show other people. They want to explain. They've met other people and have been influenced by them and want to help. So that's where a lot of this comes from. You can learn from other people. You can learn from blog posts, videos, conferences, meetups, everything. So to set the stage, hacking has whatever of a reputation for a thing. But I haven't met two people who define hack as the same thing. So I'm just going to go with we're building a hacker lab for my talk because hacker can mean what you want it to mean. And building a lab isn't always about how to break stuff. You're not going to always be building a lab for domain admin. You can learn anything. You can learn pen testing, system hardening, AppSec, forensics, administration, networking, all the intersections of things in between that. And thanks to vendors who put out virtual appliances now to promote their stuff, you can learn really anything. Totally high-end stuff that costs tens, hundreds of thousands of dollars to get a copy of the license. You can get it for free now and run it for either reduced speeds or for 30 days. You can get a copy of F5's biggest load balancers just for the cost of asking. Or maybe just talking to a couple of their sales guys for a while. So it's important to understand where you can get stuff. And I try and cover that too. Um, so that's all my intro. Uh, I tried to break it down according to money, because that's how it worked with me. When I started doing this, I had no money. I had a computer. I didn't even have two computers at the time, so I had one computer. I had not that much hard drive space, but I had a broadband internet connection. So that's where we're going to start. Um, took it up a few notches for the last couple of years. I've thrown a couple hundred bucks at it every year. That gets you a lot farther. You can buy old used equipment. You can get free software. You can keep going. And because I was on a roll, I figured I'd do the fun one. And what happens if you don't have a budget? What would you buy? Just because it's fun to look at all that stuff, even if you don't have one. And then finally, I go through all the pieces of what you're going to do with that after you have it. How do you get those VMs? How do you build those VMs? Where do you get that software? Where do you get that material to learn from? So. Before we start, just to make sure everybody's on the same page, I'm sure somebody knows these words, but this is how we're dividing them for these talk, for this talk. A virtual machine is software-based emulation of a computer. A hypervisor is software that creates, runs, and manages virtual machines. The host is the computer which a hypervisor runs on, and the guest is that virtual machine. Uh, these are going to come up over and over. And I just want to make sure we're all on the same page because sometimes these are defined in questionable manners or different manners. But for the purpose of this talk, this is where we're going with this. So let's start out with no money. Um, what are your options? When I started this, I had a desktop. But AMD, Intel, Oracle, and a few other people have worked really hard to make virtual machines the easiest way to do a lot of stuff. Um, like I said, when I started 10 years ago, there weren't very many options, but thanks to increasing miniaturization and features getting added to CPUs, this is way, way easier. So what are you going to do for hardware? This being 2014, almost 2015, I feel pretty comfortable saying everyone here has a computer that can run at least one virtual machine. Ever since 2006, 2007, AMD and Intel have been putting virtualization extensions into their CPUs. This made the big difference from what I saw trying to do this. As a Mac guy, I always wanted to run virtual PC as a kid because you could run Windows and then get games on it. You could never do that, though, because nobody ever had a computer with enough juice to do it. You only had 128 megs of RAM. You can't virtualize another OS that takes 90 megs of RAM in that. Now you can. Those virtualization extensions have changed everything. So pretty much any CPU, um, if you can get it, if you want 8 gigs or more of RAM, that's pretty hard, depending on how old your equipment is. 4 gigs is more than enough. I have a MacBook Air here with 4 gigs that runs a VM or two. It's a lot more to learn on than nothing. It's a lot more than just reading the blog post to be able to walk through some of these exercises. And then you're going to need storage, because it's a computer. You've got to have something to store it on faster the better. If you're working with no budget, whatever you can get, that works. The only required fee 
extension that you're looking for, like I said, is these virtualization extensions. Um, the biggest difference these have made was before you could run a virtual machine or the host OS, now you can run them both together because of things like this. Um, I'm not technical enough to understand how CPUs work enough to know what this difference makes. I do know the day-to-day -day of it, of what it takes to use these, and they're awesome. Now, if you know the make of your CPU or whatever, it's hard to determine whether or not these are there without trolling through a bunch of spreadsheets and things like that. But you can jump into the BIOS and look for things that say virtualization technology, enabled or disabled. When I started at Highland, our corporate laptops had this turned off. I needed VMs for stuff, so I had to talk to IS to get this turned off. So that's the big clue, though. If you don't know whether or not you have these, if you don't know whether or not they're turned off, jump into your BIOS and start poking around. AMD doesn't brand them like Intel does. Intel very nicely puts it as the Intel R virtualization technology. Um, I've never used an AMD machine, but the only picture I could find just says virtualization on or off. So if you're using whatever you can find, anything that you can find with a Core 2 or newer processor should do it. These are bad clip art, but they were free. <laughs> um, Anything you can get from your friends, from your neighbors, from your grandmas, from whatever you found in the closet that you forgot you have. Garbage pick, goodwill bought. I've acquired computers in very weird thing, ways. Um, liquidation sales, stuff like that. If it doesn't have an OS, Linux or BSD are free. All you need is an internet connection to download them. Most of them download minimal installers that will get you up and running and then you can put some stuff on top of that. If you don't have a whole lot of RAM, you can get minimal operating systems that'll still give you a good foundation to run the other stuff we're going to talk about in a minute. And if you can get something with four gigs of RAM, you can get started. You can throw two or three Linux virtual machines on there, you can load a slew of vulnerable web apps, and you can start playing with it. So what else do you need? You have hardware. Like I mentioned, you're going to need an OS. This is highly related to your hardware. You can only run a Mac OS on a Mac, according to the EULA, not reality. But um, Windows costs a license, and Linux is free. So pick what you like, pick what you can afford, pick what came on the machine, any of those things. Uh, personally, I always try and use a Mac, so I officially have worked professionally as a Windows administrator, because I can't afford Macs. Simple fact, you learn what's there and you get better at it. The next step is a hypervisor, something to run virtual machines. Um, since we have no budget, there are no other options. VirtualBox is the best thing you can get, I think. Again, opinionated. Um, it runs on every platform I've tried it on. It runs every OS I've tried to run in it. And you can, there are tons of tools, tips, tutorials, things for converting from VMware to VirtualBox. And so far as I can tell, they're way further up to date with their development than VMware because they're always releasing updates. So VirtualBox isn't shiny, it isn't expensive, it doesn't have flashy features. If you've ever seen a demo where somebody's flipping through the VMs on their Mac just by swiping across the trackpad, it doesn't do a lot of that stuff, but it works. It'll give you a virtual machine up and running quickly. So that's what you do if you have no money. If you're on a tight budget or some budget, let's say you've got 250, somewhere between 250 and 500 bucks. What can you build? What can you put together for that? It'll get you up and running, ready to put virtual machines. Um, hardware is easy to find still at this level because there's plenty of people getting rid of two-year-old gear. It's just like the used car market. Everybody has service contracts. When those service contracts come up, they get rid of their stuff. Uh, eBay's always full of hand-me-down Dells, HP, Lenovo's, anything like that. Uh, but what you want to look for here, in my experience, is enterprise gear. So Dell has their Optiplex line, um, their Latitude line for laptops, ThinkPads and Think Centers, I think, for Lenovo. HP has some string of letters and numbers. You want to have something that level because you know it's been tested, you know it's going to work for forever with no maintenance, you know it's going to have oodles of parts out on eBay if anything breaks that you know is compatible. Um, 
since we're going over a few hundred bucks, the best option here is to find a used workstation. A workstation is a server class machine with the cooling, with the quietness of a desktop. So you can get a four eight core Xeon that'll hold 16, 32 gigs of RAM for a couple hundred bucks that you can sit in your bedroom and it'll be pretty quiet. So yeah, you got lots of options. You can buy old server gear if you want. Uh, I don't recommend it because it's horrendously loud, but if you have a garage that you're willing to put it in or a spouse who doesn't care or you don't care, <laughs> go for it. It's the best option for the budget. It's just really annoying to live with. Craigslist is another good one. People go out of business, they unload all their stuff on Craigslist because they don't know anywhere about it. Their loss can be your gain for pennies on the dollar. Um, the other thing I mean, I emphasize at this point because it's what I do when I buy this stuff is do your research. Another big perk of buying enterprise gear is they all have maintenance manuals publicly available. You just type in the model number and maintenance manual and you'll get PDFs back galore usually from the official sites. Uh, this will tell you which CPUs were available in it, how many RAM slots are in it, what the default configs are, all sorts of stuff like that that you can't find from random desktop computers, you can't find reliable information. And I mentioned before, you can find parts. Dell sells Optiplexes by the thousands, or tens of thousands. So if you lose a button on the case or if you need a compatible video card or a compatible fan, you can go on eBay and find it for 10 bucks, 20 bucks. You just type in Optiplex, whatever part you need. And then, again, a host OS. So pick what you like, pick what you have available. That's personal choice. So now that you have dedicated hardware, you're not depending on whatever you have or your other computer, you can make a different choice at this point than you could before. Instead of installing Windows, Linux, or Mac, you can install a bare metal hyperlinks. What this is, is you go and you install ESX, I, Zen, or Proxmox. I haven't used the other two, but ESX, I is free. You just got to register on VMware, and it's their enterprise class product. I think it's limited to 32 gigs of RAM on the current version, but it's hard to get that in a desktop anyhow. Uh, but what this does is you I don't know about the other two, but ESXi doesn't have a host interface. You attach to it remotely, you do everything from a remote install. I put the asterisk there because you can't run ESXi without some sort of Windows machine to run the client. But it really is the best option because it's the easiest to get running and has the most features and uses the fewest resources on the platform. Another reason, the reason that I did this and that I used this is a lot of Dell and HP and Lenovo boxes are all on ESXi's hardware whitelist. So it takes no effort. You download their ISO from the, the internet, you run it on the hardware, and you're up and running in a couple of hours. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but if you choose that you want to keep a desktop for whatever reason, now that you're using a little bit of money that you've got here, say you've got an old Mac, you've got an old Windows machine, you want to leave Mac or Windows on it, what are you going to do with it? Well, there's another, we're back to the other type of hypervisor we discussed in the first example, like virtual networks, but now that you have money, you can buy a license for things like VMware Fusion, or Workstation, or Parallels, things like that. You have money to spend, so if you want to spend it on this, you can. My recommendation is buy the most hardware you can and use free software because then you'll get the most bang for your buck. My choices don't have to be yours. And finally, the fun one. What happens if money is no object? Uh, turns out computers can get really expensive. Um, my whole life as a Mac guy, I've always logged into apple.com just for fun and built the fanciest Mac Pro you can. You can build a Mac Pro worth over $100,000. Sort of. Um, so what happens? What can we see here? Turns out, <laughs> you can buy a lot. Um, if you have all of the dollars, you can buy a lot of things. Did you know Intel has 16 core processors that you can fit four in a machine if you can afford the machine? I didn't. <laughs> Fun research, though. Um, same thing. There are 32 gig sticks of RAM. That you can fit a terabyte of RAM in some of these new servers in a one-use server. 
That'd be the first thing I'd buy if I had the money. Um, put SSDs in everything. All the things have SSDs now. You can get an SSD stand or NAS. You water cool everything you've got. Buy all those 16 core processors, put a water cooler on them. They're super quiet. You can put them under your baby's bed. You can buy a bunch of those. You can buy network storage. You can buy super fast physical networking. You can run fiber in your house. I mean, this is just making enterprise IT home IT for fun. But figured while I was at it. Um, but something to keep aware of here, if you ever get into this professionally, is you're going to see these names. In there. If you do get to the point where you can try this stuff at home, vCenter and Hyper-V are the number one and number two virtual environments in any enterprise I've heard of. Short of anything like Rackspace or Squarespace hosting, things like that. Every company I've worked at so far has vCenter up and running. Um, we have it at Highland in our QA with six hosts. Um, vCenter is a management interface that fits over top of the ESXi host or hosts. So, like I said, we have six tied in our one vCenter instance. Um, that's just in QA, our production one. I don't know how many hosts they have, but a lot. Hyper V can work a lot in the same manner. Oracle VM and Zen, I haven't seen, but when I'm researching high value things, Oracle's always on the list. Um, virtualization software, you can still, I guess, if you want to, <laughs> run desktop stuff, but at that point, you're already throwing all the money at it. You might as well spend all the money on these instead of on a couple hundred dollar license for Fusion and Workstation. So that's how you get some hardware, that's how you get the base layer of software put together. But how do you get that, that to a point where you're learning stuff? How do you get to that where you're achieving goals? And what are you doing with that? Uh, you have to get your hypervisor up and running. So this is the first screenshot after it boots of an ESXi box. And it tells you nearly nothing interesting. Um, it has a Xeon CPU, it has 16 gigs of memory, and this is where you manage it. Like I said, ESXi has no client interface on the machine. You have to hit it with a web browser across the network. And then you'll get to this where you can download the client. And this is a cheat because it tries to download the client from VMware first. But when you first install this super fancy virtualization software, it goes out of its way to confuse you. You can't interact with it directly. So that's why I'm covering it here because I had to learn it all. It's not intuitive, but once you have it, it's super easy to use. Once you get there, you'll log into the client, and then you get to the easy part. You can admin, you can add VMs, create VMs, import VMs, things like that. Uh, if you're going to use one of the desktop ones, you got to go to the vendor site and grab it, and then you get to an interface that's pretty much like this. It's pretty bare on the settings. Until you create or import a machine, you're not going to have anything to do with it. You can't do anything with a VM until you get to the point where you can build it. So now the important part, um, getting your VMs. Where are you going to get all of this software? Where are you going to get this environment? Uh, this is my favorite. They sent us stickers. They're way happy to promote themselves for security. Uh, and they're super easy to work with. Volhub is, these guys are amazing. I don't know how they make their site worthwhile, but they put a site out there that compiles a list of distributions or live CDs or virtual appliances that are all challenges or intentionally vulnerable VMs, things like that. And they make them available, they make them community actionable um, so that you can go out there, you can grab them, you can learn from them, you can submit back to them what you have learned. This is what happens when you click this little walkthrough button here for a VM. It'll give you a list of solutions. It's people on the internet who've downloaded it, who've walked through it, who've found what they think are all the challenges on that VM, documented their process, and then put it back out there for other people to see, for other people to use. Uh, the download button lets you download the ISO or whatever, and then submit yours lets you respond in kind. If you think that other guy had, didn't get all the solutions, but you did, you can go through it. If you got to them with a different way, you can do it there too. Uh, so far as I've seen, this is the most concise, straightforward security learning platform out there. Um, 
I've seen vendor stuff, I've seen talks, I've seen other things. What they're doing here at Palm Hub is incredible because they're letting everyone work on the same thing together. They also have a list of resources. Their blog is fantastic. They have contests for the VMs. They cover Capture the Flag events that they've been in. They do write-ups for their Capture the Flag team. Uh, you can imagine running a site like this. There's a team of guys who work pretty hard beating up on VMs and vulnerable apps all the time. So they have a lot of awesome experience that you can learn from. Where else can you get stuff? Uh, Google search is the biggest one. You search for intentionally vulnerable, security testing, DIY lab, anything like this. Anything you can come up with synonyms for, for what we're talking about, you're going to find results. Um, I tried intentionally vulnerable VM to get a pretty screenshot. There's Metasploitable, put forth by Rapid7. There's a list of five vulnerable distros. There's, I mean, there's hundreds and hundreds of results. There's hundreds of these VMs out there. And I haven't come across any yet that I haven't been able to find at least five, seven, 12, 15 blog posts explaining how people beat the challenges on those VMs, what they did with the stuff that they found on them. You can learn all of them, and then you can build your own. The guys at Bullhub will host it for you. Um, the next best place after Bullhub and just straight up searching is GitHub. Searching here for intentionally vulnerable applications, I found super easy stuff. People go out of their way to learn what it takes to build a vulnerable app, what it takes to fix a vulnerable app, and then they put it out there for other people to deal with, for other people to play with. And GitHub's super easy. It's not the most user-friendly thing I've ever seen if you want to actually use Git to get this stuff, but you can also push a download button, download a zip file. This way has the potential to be the easiest and the hardest. You can get a zip file where you just install it, or you can get a bunch of text files and you have to figure out how to make them work on a server that you have to configure separately. Um, I've been doing that lately for fun. At work we build a capture the flag event from something I found on GitHub. I have a couple of personal ones at home that I've been playing with on here. I think the challenge is fantastic. You have to make an OS work in a virtual machine. You have to get whatever packages it takes to run these applications people built, and then you have to download somebody else's code and make it work to the point where you can interact with it. So that's great for security, but in the spirit of covering all my bases, I just said that I'm building stuff on fresh instances of an OS. Where do you find those? Um, if you don't know of Linux VMs, this is the best place to find them. If you don't know what other Unix-like operating systems are out there for free, this is a great place. They keep a list of it. Um, their advanced search lets you troll by kind, so it relates things back and forth, so like by package manager. You can search for a distribution name, you can file through the list, you can pick the random button and just get one. Um, or you can go to the, pack, the popular ones. I use Debian all the time, it's always in the top five. But that's because the first job I had where I used Linux to use Debian for everything, so that's what I know. And I guess I'm kind of lazy. Um, once you get to it, you just go in. It's got all kinds of details about the project, the software installed, what it runs on, that kind of thing. All kinds of links. Um, the official home pages, the official forums. Some of them have unofficial forums of documentation linked here, related websites. If you don't have a good download link, where to buy it? They're really looking out for you. They really want you to be able to get this stuff and work with it. Um, in the spirit of covering all ends, I looked on what it would take to get a free Windows VM because Microsoft is notoriously strict on licensing. So for the last couple of years, they've been putting out these modern IE VMs that they claim will run on any platform. I haven't ever used one just because I have a Windows license that I use for things, and that's about it. Or I use my work computer when I need Windows stuff. But that's another thing that's out there. Even Microsoft is getting on the bandwagon of giving away learning resources for free. And vendors. Um, I alluded to this at the top, but let's see. In my position, I've had to deal with a lot of high-end networking stuff, and so far, every one of them has if not their topmost stuff in a virtual appliance, some of their lower stuff. You can get experience with high-end Citrix Netscalers, F5 load balancers, Fortinet stuff, Riverbed stuff. 
things that when I started in this industry, you only ever heard of or you saw used on eBay for five grand. You couldn't get to that stuff to learn it without getting a job as a senior sysad. Now you can get it and run it on a laptop. So everybody wants to promote themselves one way or another. Vendors do that by making their stuff available. Um, one way to find that kind of stuff, VMware keeps a list of virtual appliances. Um, I haven't looked at it in a long time, but the last time I did, this wasn't exactly current. However, you can go here and find something interesting and go back to the vendor's homepage and see if they have a more current version. Um, trying to get stuff from vendors, you might have to register for emails, you might have to talk to their marketing folks. It depends on what you're trying to learn or how hard you're trying to learn it. If you really want to learn high-end networking, that's still a really, really low barrier to entry. You can get to the point where you can ask a lot of serious questions just by throwing one of these on a virtual box or a VMware instance and playing with it. Um, now the boring part. Uh, I don't have any good slides for how you make them work because this is dependent on whatever you're trying to do. If you're trying to get a vulnerable web app, there's a half dozen web app VMs that come with old versions of Joomla with WordPress, things like that, that have long lists of published vulnerabilities. You just install the ISO and you turn it on with a network interface and you can get to it. There's other stuff that takes configuration. Um, Utility is out there. And if you want to keep that, keep it updated. That's a whole walkthrough of every Every, most every web vulnerability out there from SQL injection to authentication problems. Um, VulnHub is full of stuff boot to root where you install it and you've got a root prompt. You have to figure out what ports it's running, what services it's running on those ports, what they're vulnerable to, what versions they are, how to get to them, how to get to root. Um, some of those don't have any documentation on them, even though a lot do. So making those VMs work once you have them is the first step in the challenge, then you gotta use them for what your goal is. Well, what if I'm really lazy? What if I don't wanna do any of this? Lucky for you, even security training has gotten to the software as a service kind of a thing. Um, there's tiers, they, most of them cost money, but there are ways to learn it without even building a virtual lab. The best part of any talk is somebody playing devil's advocate in the audience, right? So I'm not trying to do that here. What if you don't want to do any of this work? You just want to learn by attacking something or by taking something apart. People got you covered on that too. If you want to learn routing, Cisco has a virtual internet routing lab. You don't have to get GNS3. You don't have to get pirate images of iOS. You don't have to try and put all this stuff together and make it work. Go pay Cisco however much a month and you get Cisco's machines, you get Cisco's equipment. You get access to Cisco people to talk to you about it. It's another way. Um, sometime next year, the offensive security guys, they're gonna open their labs. They're calling it a playground. Kevin, is it a playground? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> sure, it's fine. These guys are known for having one of the most hands-on difficult certifications around there, particularly related to security. So pretty soon they're going to have, I assume it's going to be paid, but they haven't released a lot of details yet. They're going to have an environment you get VPN credits in and you just go in here and have fun, own the place, learn everything you want to learn. And they have an IRC channel for their search stuff, right? So you're going to have people there who are doing the same things that you are doing while you're doing it and you can talk to, bounce ideas off, questions off. You can answer other people's questions. CTF365, uh, these guys haven't had the best year. Um, they had a leak where somebody tried to hack the system instead of hack the game, but it's another one. It's a platform. They have very low cost tiers where you can get a VPN into their environment and you can attack systems, you can defend systems, you can learn on the fly, hands on, with real systems against real attacks. Um, Rootme.org is a free one, there's a few more. You just create an account, you log in, and you start solving problems. You start finding solutions. If you're like me, you start getting frustrated right away and Googling for people who put the answers on a different site. It's another way to learn stuff, hands-on, out, and these ones are free. 
Here's another couple, War Games. Um, when we started our apps that group at Highland, we spent more than a few weeks going through these just to get everybody on the same page with how you interact with this stuff, how you search for security problems. They're great because at least the first 10, 20 levels are very easy to catch up with, easy to find the answers to. Um, the best question we had when we did those as a group was some kid in the back with a laptop goes, can we cheat? This is hackers and security. You can cheat all day long. The goal is to get to the end. Hackertainment. There's a few other places, I couldn't find the links off the top of my head on the way here, but there's plenty of people who just compile the list of these online games where you can play this stuff. But they're built around real technologies. The War Games one, they were all PHP vulnerabilities. Command injection, SQL injection, all sorts of stuff like that. So, the opportunity is there. You can build it yourself or you can go use somebody else's that they worked really hard to build and make accessible. You can do it. That's really the end of where I'm at. I've done this. I came into this knowing just how to use Photoshop. And I've gotten to the point where I'm giving talks like this. I give a talk at DerbyCon. I'm still doing this at home every weekend. I'm still doing this every day on my laptop to try and learn more about it. It doesn't take a whole lot to get into it. It's not that difficult. Um, there are lots and lots and lots of people on the internet who will help you. There are lots of people here who will help you. Even if people don't have their own home labs, it's pretty easy to find people who run real infrastructure who can still answer your questions. And that's it. Um, here's a way you can contact me if you have any interest to. Uh, if you want the slides, if you want the links, let me know. If you have any comments, criticisms, concerns about my talk, please let me know. I'm open to any and all feedback. I just want to get better at this, and if I can help other people get better at this along the way, all's the better. Thank you. December, however, we're skipping the community night because it's the holidays. And we're pretty sure no one's going to show up. Um, so, community night for December is canceled, not happening. Our next meeting then will be January 13th, the second Tuesday of January. At, uh, that will take place at Highland Software um, in Westlake. Does anyone have any announcements you want to make here? Anything? You want to share it all? Oh, we got an announcement. No question. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> He's just walking in. B-Sides Columbus. Restroom's over there, by the way. No, B-Sides Columbus. Um, oh, that's coming up at the end. I have the current, like, upcoming events. So, this is like community stuff. <laughs> we, we got our stuff separated. It's just, it's organized. There's more sandwiches. That's an announcement there. All right. Uh, excellent. So with that, let's welcome Nancy to talk about tech recruiting. Um, we've been around since 1991. 
um, and we're still very much focused on the, the development of our on-base product. And this slide is, is to just really show you um, why I'm here speaking about hiring. When I started at Highland um, just over six years ago, I was around employee number 700. Um, so I've seen the company grow. I've been in, the, in um, recruiting that entire time. Um, and I've seen the fluctuations of, of recruiting and what we as technical recruiters look for. So to get started, um, what I've done tonight to, to build this talk is I've taken um, the questions that Marian um, has supplied me with um, from you, so thank you for, for giving me those. Um, and I've broken it out into a few different steps of the hiring process. So first starting with the application process and what it's really like. Um, as you are probably aware, the way that the recruiter sees it and the way that you see it as a potential job seeker can be vastly different. So what do you think happens um, when a position becomes available at a company? What's the first thing that happens? Anybody? Thank you, Howard. Howard says send out an announcement, and that is one of the first things. Um, but before all of that, there is a lot of legwork that goes into the discovery of the position. So as a recruiter, you're responsible for um, really getting to know the hiring manager and the position that you're recruiting for. Um, me, as a technical recruiter, I don't know all of those keywords um, that Warren was mentioning in his talk, but I can certainly Google those. I can certainly have a conversation with the hiring manager to um, get a better understanding of that. So when you see a position posted um, on a, a career's website, please know that the recruiter isn't reviewing those applications blindly. Um, we are looking for those words that stick out to us, um, groups like this that are on your resume. Um, that are standing out as, as showing you as, as a person who's passionate about what you do. So here are some questions, um, and please, I'd like to make this interactive, so please feel free to interrupt me at any time if you think of other questions that come up. So the first, um, what are the top three criteria for filtering out candidates? So that is dependent on the position. Um, each company will recruit a bit differently. At Highland Software, we do not use software um, to search for keywords and automatically get rid of 80% of the resumes that are coming in. A recruiter is actually reading every single application and resume um, that comes in as a, a potential employee of Highland. Um, so we don't necessarily have three main criteria. Um, but we are looking for people who, you know, who fit um, what we're looking for. The, the best thing is to read the job description and then maybe tailor your resume um, around that job. If you're applying for a, a security or a network engineer job, um, that's going to be different than applying for a software development job or a quality assurance job. So make sure that you're not just blindly throwing out resumes out there, um, but that you are taking at least a few minutes to maybe rewrite the objective on your resume. Um, what will keep me from being filtered out by automated filters? So again, we're not using those automated filters. I know that there are companies um, that do use those. So I can't speak for those companies, um, but I can let you know that we are looking, when you're reviewing a resume, for those keywords. Um, so if it's for, again, a, a security type of position, are you we looking for some type of virtualization or VMware? Um, words like that that will stick out to the recruiter to say, hey, you know, this person does know what they're talking about. Are college and university degrees a must? or will certifications and experience get you through the screening? Um, again, and I'll just, I'll quit saying this now, but I, my answers are all um, based on my experience with Highland and what we do. Um, on, 
most of our job postings, you will see that it says a, a maybe a, a bachelor's or an associate's degree or um, equivalent experience that qualifies you for the position. We completely understand that there are circumstances that uh, may not allow you to finish your degree. Um, and, and maybe that experience building um, a virtual machine at home has really taken you farther in your experience um, than what a, a degree would. Of course, we value degrees and we value um, your ability to graduate with those. Um, we are completely open to um, a mixture of both types. What do you do if you don't recognize um, a certification on a resume? Google is my best friend. Um, I like to compare it um, to international recruiting. So right now the recruiting that I actually do is, is based um, internationally. And the other day I was um, reviewing applications for our Brazil office and of course a lot of those um, applications that are coming through, the resumes are all in Portuguese. So Google Translator. I threw the resume in, copied and pasted it, got it in English. It's the same exact thing for me when I'm Googling um, different technologies because, quite frankly, that can be a foreign language to me. How much of de job descriptions are accurate and negotiable? Um, I would hope that they're accurate, but I will also tell you that hiring managers, when they're posting jobs, are really looking for um, that best fit person. So if you don't meet every single criteria on um, the job requirements, submit an application anyway. Um, the recruiter and the hiring manager will be able to say, okay, maybe they don't have four years of experience we're looking for, but maybe they have three years and um, they're a part of a, a group like this that really shows um, your passion about certain technologies and technology. How likely am I to actually get hired from a job posting? And do I need internal connections? No, you do not need internal connections. Um, I can't really put a, a percentage behind how likely you are to get hired, but please do your due diligence. Um, read through job postings. Make sure that what you're applying for is something that you'd actually like to do. It is very frustrating um, for a recruiter if they're calling you for a phone screen because you're qualified for, for a position, and you answer the phone and say, you know, I'm actually not interested in that position. It was just the first one I found on your website. That, that's not a great idea, and um, I don't think that any of you in this room have done that. <laughs> so any other questions um, based on resumes, how resumes are reviewed, the application process in general? Yes? Um, a GPA. Yes. I think that GPAs um, are great to put on a resume um, if it's above, I'm going to throw this out here, maybe a, a 3.0. Um, I think that the importance of putting a GPA on a resume disappears after you've had your first professional experience. Um, I actually graduated from VW in um, 2008. Um, if I were going to apply for a job today, I would not put my GPA on my resume. Quite frankly, I don't think I remember it. Um, I can go look that up. Um, it is important. It, it shows that you know, you've had the, the tenacity to, to get through school and to um, hopefully get those good grades. If it's detracting from your experience, it's not necessary to put it on there. Any other questions? Right. I'm curious about uh, what resume format you prefer, the chronological years, mm -hmm. if you have, maybe you don't have work experience, if you do the trick they tell you to skip it or don't put dates on it, mm -hmm. how do recruiters look at those kinds of resumes? Yes. Um, from the recruiting standpoint, um, the first thing I will say is bullets are your best friend. Don't write in paragraphs. It is difficult to read all of your experience in paragraphs and to understand if a comma is 
there at the right place and how to understand that it makes Googling those technologies a little harder when you don't really know. Um, so I would start with your most recent experience. Um, I would also highlight your education, um, especially if it's applicable to the position, and go down from there. Um, if there are areas where you were unemployed, um, you know, it's okay to, to skip those. If there is an option to write a cover letter, I think that's a great place to explain um, what you did during that time that you were unemployed. And you can also add to your resume um, what you did when you were unemployed as well. So again, coming to a group like this twice per month is a great activity to add to your resume. Anything else? So we'll, we'll get, yes? Uh, what's the time to drop things off again in person? Say that again, please. What's, what's a, a good idea of when to drop things off again in person? Maybe you have three or four hours. Mm -hmm. you know, what's sort of the, the, uh, the limit that people will go by? Sure. And we'll, we'll get a bit more into this here. So I'll skip to a, um, just a OK, there, second, second bullet. Thank you. Um, is it okay for a tech resume to be longer than a page? Yes, I think it's okay. Um, I wouldn't go longer than two pages. So if you're getting close to the end of those two pages and it just seems like it's kind of dragging on, at that point, maybe start um, making the, the list smaller. Maybe just show where you worked and one bullet or two bullets about what you did there versus your most recent experience should be um, more in depth. Does that answer your question? Okay. So is lying on a resume ever okay? No. Um, I have had the um, pleasure of getting to the offer stage with candidates to find out that um, their, their education was fabricated. Um, and we rescind offers for that reason. So, you know, just go ahead, put things on your resume that are truthful. Um, there are, are creative ways, again, um, showing the things that you're interested in if you don't have a ton of experience, um, put that on your resume versus making up a job that, that you really didn't do. Um, background checks are done, you know, at the majority of companies, or at least they should be doing this, um, before offers are made. And um, not only are our background checks done for the criminal side of your history, um, but also for education and employment as well. Are resumes enough these days, or should tech-savvy people have portfolios? Um, would portfolios get any attention? I think at the application stage, um, a resume is enough. However, when you are coming to that interview, it's great to have a portfolio ready. You can't guarantee that every hiring manager is going to look at that um, for probably the amount of time that you would want them to based on how much time you put into preparing that. Um, but if you have something on hand, maybe you're a recent college graduate and you did that as your capstone project um, to be able to graduate, certainly bring that to the interview. And what are some do's and don'ts for resumes? I feel like we've already covered a bit of that. So lying, again, never okay. Um, keep it to two pages. Um, use your discretion on that one. If you can fit all of your experience on one page, make it one page. Um, one of the things that I notice about resumes are the margins. Probably not every recruiter. Um, notices things like that or is bothered by things like that. But when I look at a resume, if there is a two inch margin on each side and the resume is four pages long, I'm scrolling through, I'm scrolling through, and I'm just kind of frustrated by the end of it. So take a look at it, um, have a friend review it, a family member review it, and just say, hey, what would you think if you were reviewing this and, and didn't know me? And what's the worst resume you've ever seen? Um, I don't know that I can pinpoint the worst resume I've ever seen, um, but typos really bother me. Um, spell check is easy to just click that little button. Um, so do your due diligence 
be prepared to submit the resume. Um, and also be sure that if you're writing a company's name on a resume, say your objective is to get a job at Highland Software, then the next company that you're applying to, take Highland Software out of there. It's an automatic <laughs> disqualifier. Any other questions about resumes? Yes? I've seen some resumes with pictures on mm -hmm. them. You know, like uh, professional photos mm -hmm. and like that. We can put those. I would not recommend pictures. Um, in the HR world, we have to be very careful about um, discrimination um, and, and things that the government is holding us accountable to. Um, we don't need to see a picture to make a hiring decision, um, and it actually it is not going to help a candidate either way. Great question. Okay. All right, and then interview. So you get to the interview stage, um, and you're probably a bit nervous, and um, if you were like me, I remember Googling how to prepare for an interview. Again, different for every single company. At, at some companies, you may not ever meet with a recruiter. Um, at other companies, you may meet with a recruiter, a team leader, a hiring manager, the entire team, the vice president, um, and the list can go on and on. So be prepared for the unknown. Um, don't go into a company thinking you know exactly what's going to happen, even if you have a referral from that company. It can be a completely different interview process from one department to another. Um, I've seen candidates get really thrown off when maybe they're not meeting with the person they were expecting to meet with, um, and that becomes an uncomfortable conversation. Um, so just go in with an open mind, be willing and happy to meet the people that are put in front of you. So do technical questions actually get asked during the interview? If you're applying for a technical position, I would say that definitely technical questions get asked. Um, there's only so much you can learn from a resume, so be prepared to, to give examples, um, to talk about your experiences both on the job um, and at home as well. I recruited for um, quality assurance at Highland Software for a few years. And um, we hire people who um, are entry level for some of those, those roles. People that are coming straight out of college, maybe have had um, one summer of an internship, um, but don't have a lot of experience to speak to. So talk about the computer that you build at home. Um, talk about your technical interests and what you do to research those and how you research those um, and the time you spend working on, on those technologies. Um, I would also say that if you're going for a technical interview and they're not asking technical questions, to be a little concerned um, because you may be interviewing at a place where technology is not their main driver. How important are soft skills um, and which are the most important? This will depend on the job. Um, at Highland, we are, are working through a career development initiative, um, which really gives every position in a department a list of competencies. Some of those companies, competencies are um, based on soft skills, so it can depend um, on, on the position. Um, as far as soft skills that are important across the board, um, being polite is one of those. Um, <laughs> that's, that's just a given when you're interviewing. Not everyone is an extrovert. We're all different. Interviews are um, challenging and uncomfortable. Uh, but if you can at least be polite, uh, that shows you know, a good foot forward. How much should I learn about the company before the interview? And does that still matter? Yes, it does still matter. Um, Take a look at the company's website. If that's all you do, um, it's a great starting point. Pinpoint one or two things that you take away from that website and take a few notes. Take your, your notebook, whatever you're taking to the interview, um, and when the question for you at the end of the interview comes up, do you have any questions for me? Be prepared with those questions that show that you've researched the company um, and that you would be invested in working at that company. 
How important is dressing up for an interview nowadays, and especially for a technical role? This is a tough question, um, especially when you work for a company, when you see people wearing shorts in the middle of winter, when it's like minus 20 degrees out, and flip-flops, it happens. Um, so I'll speak from experience. I've never heard a manager say, wow, that person was way too dressed up for this interview today. But I have heard hiring managers say, hey, what's up with that person? Why'd they wear jeans to the interview? And I can answer that question. I can say, because the, the old saying used to be, dress as the people dress at the company. Well, that's becoming a little bit different now that we're in um, times when, when jeans and business casual attire are completely normal. Um, again, I recommend maybe not wearing a, a, a suit jacket if you're not comfortable with it, but at least wearing um, a suit and tie if you can. Um, again, I've never heard a manager say that person was way too dressed up. And don't worry, um, at companies like Highland, yes, you will stick out. Um, people will know you're interviewing, but that's okay. Um, they're so used to it that their people are not, you know, taking a second look at you. So please don't be worried about sticking out. Questions? Okay. And then miscellaneous questions. These are some great ones. Um, what can graduates do to stand out? I touched on this a bit um, before. So highlight your experience um, both out of school, so the things that you like to do in your free time, um, and both in school. Talk about your projects. Consider your projects in your technical courses to be real experience. They are. Um, and not only is that technical experience real, but working with a team is real as well. Um, you will have those same challenges when you're working with a team in a college class um, that you do in the workspace. Be prepared also to talk about those experiences, um, to talk about if you were the leader of the team, if you weren't the leader of the team, how you contributed to that project, what the outcome of that project was, um, and what you would also do differently. It's very important in an interview to be able to um, express feedback that you've been given about yourself, and um, if it's constructive criticism, what are you doing to make yourself better? What do recruiters look for in entry-level tech jobs? Um, again, the, the passion, um, the people who are enthusiastic, um, and that can show through a resume. Again, saying you built, you've been building um, home computers computers at home um, since you were in middle school. That's a great way to highlight that on your resume. Does working at Best Buy actually help? Yes, um, for a few reasons. So besides the, the technical experience, what do you think is the other um, thing that I would see as, as a, a highlight for someone working at Best Buy? Any ideas? Reliability. Yep, reliability, showing up to work on time, customer service. Um, really, no matter what company you work for, at some point you're going to most likely <laughs> deal with a customer. Um, even if you think that you know, you're the most technical person there and you're just going to be sitting in a little closet cubicle all day, somehow that customer will find you and will ask you <laughs> questions. Um, so that, that customer service is great to highlight on your resume. Are you impressed if someone has a home lab? Of course. Um, again, shows the enthusiasm, um, shows that you are, are willing to do things on the weekend um, that's not just you know, sitting there and watching TV. Shows that you're interested in it, shows that um, you won't get stale, that you're always researching new technologies, um, and that you're open to new technologies as well. Do you actually look for candidates on career sites? And then I will loop this in also um, to the, the LinkedIn question after. Yes, um, companies pay big bucks for their recruiters to own what's called a LinkedIn recruiter license. Um, this means that those people that you see on LinkedIn that say, Lindsay L, if you were looking at me, as a recruiter, I pay the money to be able to see that last name and to see that profile. 
something LinkedIn doesn't tell you. Um, those of you who only put the last initial um, <laughs> on your profile. But yes, it does help. Um, that's where a recruiter will start. The first, one of the first things you do when you're a recruiter and you have a position open is jump on LinkedIn. You'll look for the group, so you may want to start using that, that LinkedIn <laughs> group a little bit more. Um, and then you set up searches. So those keywords that you learned from your hiring manager, um, I keep using virtualization, but VMware. I can make a search that keeps running over and over all day long and um, throws me candidates that I then reach out to. So keep your, your profile on LinkedIn updated um, and I can assure you that companies will be reaching out to you um, to say, hey, are you interested? Um, as far as other career sites, LinkedIn is by far the best out there. Um, Indeed is another great site. Um, it actually pulls all job postings um, basically in the state of Ohio and um, at no cost to the employer. So employers are using Indeed um, quite frequently. The, the database portion of it, so how you search through resumes, isn't as great or, or robust as LinkedIn, um, but it is definitely a great way to see what positions are out there. When you see a position, click on the job posting. If it's of interest to you, go directly to that, that employer's website. Do you look at a candidate's social profile um, to get to know their personality? We don't at Highland. Um, there, is, there are probably companies that do. Um, there's a, a very fine line uh, in the legal world of what's okay and what's not okay. Um, again, your, your personal life is not something that, that I, as a recruiter, am necessarily interested in if you can um, perform your job well at work. So no, we are not screening those. Um, if, if you are concerned about it and if you are applying to companies where you think it might be a possibility, just put some, some extra security and privacy on it. Um, what do you think of companies who require a candidate or employees to give up their social media passwords? So just um, for a question, did any of your companies, have any of your companies required that? No? Okay. Um, I would leave that up to the legal department of that company <laughs> to, to, make, to, to give that answer. Um, again, we at Highland do not do that. And does listing event attendance help? Yes, of course. Um, as much as you can be involved in the community, um, it's a great thing. Not only because you're learning about the things that you um, are passionate about, but you're also doing the networking. Um, I am involved in recruiting groups in Cleveland. If I were ever looking for a job, that is the first place I would be going to go to my network and say, hey, what's open at your companies? Um, what's it really like? Would I fit in there? So use these events, again, for that networking. Um, and the people here, you know, I can speak for Highland. If, they, if you were to, to come back, Chris, uh, from one of these meetings and say, hey, I have a candidate for you, for a job, I would be all over that. Um, so that is a great way um, to get to get your name out there. And then just um, to leave you with a quote, um, when you're thinking about interviewing places, and I'll let you read it, uh, but this is so true. Um, come prepared, um, be self-confident, and um, be, be willing to ask questions. That really shows your interest in the job. So any other questions for me? Yes? Do you guys use Google as a filter name? Or when we're searching for candidates? Well, I think about it. Uh, and, and instead of social media? No. Mm -mm. We don't. No, we're looking, um, we'll look at LinkedIn profiles. Um, to see if they match the resume that's coming in, um, but that's not across the board. We're really using the background check, um, again, the education and employment verification um, to ensure that that information is accurate. Yes? Speaking of preparation, if you are if you have uh, several steps in the interview, like you have maybe like a pre-interview over mm -hmm. the phone or over Skype or something, 
Um, and then you have uh, an interview on site. Um, are there different things they should prepare for, for for these different types of interviews, or should we just great? Yeah, I understand. Over preparing, yes, I <laughs> <laughs> Over preparing would be good. Um, <laughs> As soon as you're scheduled for an interview and either someone in the HR department would schedule that interview for you, ask who you will be meeting with. Um, if you're meeting with a recruiter, your um, questions may be different than if you're meeting with the hiring manager. Um, the recruiter will have insight into what your day-to-day -day duties and responsibilities will look like, um, but that hiring manager will have way more in-depth um, you know, this is what you're doing from 9 to 10 every day, and, and so on. Um, so I would prepare different lists of, of questions, and again, over-prepare. Um, but you can also ask the same questions if they're uh, applicable to, to both people. You know, asking questions about the company works for both a recruiter interview and a hiring manager interview. Can I ask that, actually? Phone interviews from what I did, like if someone was to set you up for like a phone free screen, I guess mm -hmm. is what we call it. It's usually to gauge your personality more so than your technical skills, in that, well, I say usually from what I've seen. Maybe not, I mean, <laughs> um, but like there might be a few technical questions because it usually will be with someone that you would be working with on the team in a technical aspect, but a lot of it too is just to make sure that you're a cool person relative to how the company works and that you know you fit in with their culture kind of thing so mm -hmm. questions are good but it's usually more casual conversation than the in-person interview and though to definitely be prepared i phone screened a guy once and i asked him um so what has you interested in your company he goes oh well i just really need a job and so i just started applying to things <laughs> i said okay that's that's awesome. So what about our particular job posting made you want to apply to our company? He goes, well, I just really, really need a job, so I just was applying to what I can find. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're gonna, so you do need to know something about the company. But right, yeah. right. Really and fun. again, you know, I, I've had those phone conversations where we ha I have a call scheduled with a candidate, and I call them, and they're like, now what position is this again? <laughs> it's just, it's an automatic red flag that is, you know, you're not interested in working for our company. We have um, a lot of people who are really interested in working for the company. Um, so why why do we want to spend our time here? Good point. Um, speaking from like the security aspect, is there a particular certification you prefer or rank, or would you prefer to have like a general certification? And then, like, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. like, is there, I know from where you're coming from, from your point of view, what do you think are like the Sure. Um, and I'm going to, to give a somewhat roundabout answer here. It really depends on the department. Um, so at Highland, we have security groups in quality assurance and development in our cloud services group. Um, so Howard, maybe if I can pick on you for a minute. Um, Howard is in our um, global cloud services division. Um, so do you have an answer as to what would be, and actually, we have a position open right now. This is my one little plug. Um, we have a um, network and security engineer position open um, on Howard's, in Howard's group. Yeah, um, but it, it depends, answer is right on. Um, the particular position we're trying to fill, the security engineer position, the, the, the candidate would care for um, some general, some advanced, IPS, um, IDS kind of deployment, um, escalations, general day to day kind of things. And um, our interest is really in an individual that has experience in that space. And if you can demonstrate that, you know, great. Um, individuals that come in with certifications on platforms that we really support, um, not so much Cisco, we aren't a Cisco shop, but um, uh, some of the others, right? Uh, but certainly Cisco candidates like stand out right, for us as well. You have um, certification and you can back it up with experience. Oh yeah, um, honestly the recruiters um, would flag those resumes, those applications, hiring managers will see them and, and jump on those. Um, and like I tell everybody, <laughs> apply at, at highland.com or onbase.com or whatever. It takes you to the 
same place. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Never mind. Now we're going to go this way. <laughs> what's, your, what's your level of um, being comfortable doing that? Or somebody comes to you and says, hey, now you're going to be working on this project that you know nothing about. What are you going to do? Are you going to say no, not do it? Or are you going to jump in and say, I'm going to go research this. I'm going to figure out how I'm going to do this. So you do not have to be a poet. It also does not even have to be 40 words long if you don't want it to be. <laughs> We've had some really good ones, though. Some that, that go with, um, you know, song, melodies, things like that. Yeah, it can be entertaining. We do not share those publicly. <laughs> Only the recruiters can see those. Um, so don't worry. We're not posting them anywhere in the company for everyone to read. Yes? Responding. 
Yeah. <laughs> Just get a little again sad and um, actually on, on LinkedIn Recruiter, um, one of the there's a lot of metrics that, that go into um, the product that the recruiting team would purchase. Um, so you see your response rate and you're always trying to to get that response rate higher. But a lot of that responsibility is on the recruiter. If you're getting a message that you realize is completely canned and probably has been sent to 50 other people, you know, that's on the recruiter. Yes. I'm just curious if that timeline, you know, what your ratio, when you get um, applications for a uh, job to be posted, typically how many do you get? How many are immediately pulled out because they just were flattened and coming applications everywhere? How many are, uh, you know, reasonable to be actually looked at? Mm -hmm. Well, we review every single application. Um, even when, you know, the, the position is has been closed, we'll go through those and say, are they a fit for any other position at Highlands? Um, I don't have numbers off the, the top of my head of how many applications are moved um, from the application point to the first phase of phone screens or resumes, or I'm sorry, um, or review, the hiring manager review, but I can tell you that um, our level of um, Resumes that we see receive to date this year is between 14 and 15 thousand, and you saw we hired um, about 290 people this year. Some of those are duplicate applications where a person has applied maybe 10 times, and that's okay. You know, if different if different positions become available throughout the year, um, certainly you are you are welcome to go apply. Don't let those numbers. Um, become discouraging um, there are a lot of a lot of different reasons why that can happen um, and some of those are accounting for internships as well so those the interns we've hired about 76 interns this year so a big chunk of those will be intern applications that are included in that number so Sure, it, it depends. Um, you know, those entry-level jobs will receive a, a much greater response rate um, than a very experienced job. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you for your time. I have, um, I, I didn't bring any Highland gear, however, um, at your next meeting at Highland, I can have some, some things for you to take home. I do have my business cards here. If anybody is looking for a job, I'm, I'm happy to, to talk to you. Um, or if you're not looking for a job, I'm happy to speak as well. Um, but our careers application um, or our careers website is on my card here if you um, would like to take a look around. So I'll put them on this front table here. Thank you. Thank you. and conferences. There's a uh, pie, I guess that's how you say it. Okay. Um, pie okay. The, it's, a, it's a Python meetup on the, for the local Cleveland community. Uh, Rachel will be speaking there on <laughs> January 12th <laughs> about just introductory Python. Or um, yeah, I'm going to do a, like a Python-based kind of scratch thing mm -hmm. for super, super basic little stuff. And then I was going to go into Right. I'm going to be learning on that one too, so I'm not quite sure. <laughs> Something for everybody. Yeah. It sounds good. Uh, and besides Columbus, the course is happening on January 19th. Uh, tickets are on sale now, they're just 20 bucks. So uh, the, the URL is really long, so we just put their Twitter handle there. <laughs> Go to the Twitter page, they have the, all the information there from their tweets. Uh, if you just Google for Besides Columbus 2015, you should find the, the listing as well. Just don't um, 
don't make the mistake of going to the 2014 <laughs> website. I did that. <laughs> so they haven't released a schedule yet. The CFP, last I checked, is also still open. So you can submit uh, ideas, you know, your, your talk if you want to present at besides Columbus. And the Cleveland Locks Sport will still have a meeting um, this month on December 20th. The, you can get more details on their meetup webpage. And if no one else has the what, stickers? Yeah. Yes, come get stickers. Um, I have, so, yeah, so I have the, during the last, was it the last one? I think it was. No, it was the October meeting. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, during the October meeting, um, I presented a simple, it, it kind of has to do with Warren, talk, with, with what Warren presented today. Um, a little presentation about sort of uh, a little hands-on project to promote security awareness. And um, I brought the leftover CDs. It's a live boot. You can um, use it with uh, a virtualization platform or just put it on your laptop and boot the OS from the CD. It, uh, it has instructions and everything. Um, if you're interested in these, talk to me and I'll give you a link instead because since we have a teacher with us, I'm just going to give him all the CDs he can distribute to the to his students. That'd be great. Um, I forgot your name, sorry. <laughs> but I'll, um, I'll come talk to you later too. Um, great, so if no one has any other announcements? Okay. Happy holidays. We'll see you all next year.